good to see as we gather to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Um, I know we'll have hopefully uh, more people virtually. We've got less here. We weren't able to do the cantata. We felt like um, based on the number of cases, especially in the choir, we weren't able to do that. Uh, and also the idea of singing, there was concern about that. So we decided not to do the cantata this morning. Uh, our goal is to continue to have live services. Uh, I remember a few years ago we were talking about um, uh, uh, quitting on uh, suspending and stopping Wednesday nights or Sunday nights because attendance had gotten so low. And I remember talking to Jim. He's like, we never want to retreat. And um, so that's one of our goals is to not have to retreat. We may have to back up and reposition, um, but our goal is to, as much as possible, have worship services in person. That's why we've added some precautions. And um, we feel like um, in a room this size, our, we've been running um, around 100 people in a 500-seat sanctuary. And with, um, so we feel like there's enough room to keep people safe with the size crowds we've been having. Uh, one of the things we are going to add today uh, that we didn't send out is we are going to uh, encourage you not to sing. Now, that just kills me, because normally I'm trying to get you to sing more. Um, but one of the ways that our uh, stuff spreads quicker is through singing. And so one action that a lot of churches have taken is to not have congregational singing. And so we'll ask you to sing low, um, but not to sing um, real loud today for that. And so our goal is to continue uh, to make adjustments so that we can have worship services. Our concern over Sunday school, quite honestly, is just the size of the rooms. Uh, some of our rooms are plenty big, other rooms it's pretty tight. And so uh, knowing that there were more cases in Eastover, knowing there were more cases within our congregation uh, for this week, uh, we decided not to um, have Sunday school. I would encourage you, if you um, did not receive the messages from the church the last two days, either by email, by phone, or by text, uh, to let us know in the office. We're going to review all of our um, list tomorrow uh, because I've gotten word from a couple people that didn't get the message for one reason or the other so we're going to be double checking those um, and in these times where we're making adjustments based on what's going on we want to make sure that we're keeping everybody as informed as possible if you're a visitor and you're not a member you are more than welcome to get on our list uh, so that you can see that as well um, so those are the major things just as far as the COVID related and why we didn't do the cantata and wanted to make sure you were aware of that again our goal as much as possible is to have a live service but we also want to make sure uh, that we are sensitive to everybody's safety and helping everybody get through hopefully this is not going to be much longer and um, we'll be able to get back as close to what we can as normal in the future okay for regular announcements um, we are continuing to collect our Lottie Moon Christmas offering our goal is $17,000 uh, we raised just over 17, like 17,028, I think, last year, so right at 17,000. So we're asking that you pray about that. That, again, is the most important offering that we do, I believe, a uh, special offering that we do because it goes directly to missionaries, uh, their support for their salaries, or to uh, their supplies. And the number of missionaries as Southern Baptists that we have on the field is directly related to the amount of the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we're able to put more people out, the more money that we have to be able to support. So I would encourage you to pray about that. As we get near the end of the year, if you have um, any gifts, tithes, offering uh, to make sure they get in for this tax year, we need that by noon on December 31st. Uh, if you have any receipts to be reimbursed because you've bought something for the church and you need to be reimbursed for that, uh, that needs to be in by noon on December 31st as well, our offering envelopes for next year are on the pew back behind the sanctuary. Uh, so if you get a chance, you can pick those up uh, when you get the opportunity. Um, January 3rd. So this year we have been um, reading through the Bible together, and I've been real encouraged by that. How many people I've heard talking about that? The goal next year is instead of looking at big pictures, is to look at small pictures. And I have worked up a devotional schedule uh, for the year that we're going to make available. I think it always helps if we're reading and studying the same thing uh, so we can talk about it to each other. And so starting on January 1st, there will be a list of passages and we're going to get some worksheets to you. And uh, on, Monday, on Sunday night, January 3rd at 6 o'clock in here, um, we're, we're going to go over the tools that we're providing to help you study the Bible better um, individually uh, and how to really... So when I read the Bible, what am I trying to get out of it? And what's the process? And a lot of us probably, I know as a layperson, I never thought about that. And so we want to make sure that we're using effective time 
uh, when we study God's Word. And so we're going to have a, we'll, we'll be doing a thing in here on Sunday night, January 3rd, um, to help you learn how to uh, read the Bible more effectively in the coming year. Um, this year, our family, um, did our, for our Christmas card, instead of doing a regular letter and updating um, everybody on it, we decided to send a poem. And so I wanted to read that this morning. Um, and uh, it's, it's basically our Christmas card to the church from Barbara and myself. This has been a crazy year, staying home and the like. And most of us would like to tell COVID, take a hike. But as always true with God, after darkness comes light. Even when there's bitter loss, trust in God's wondrous might. Jesus came into this world so he could give us peace. From the struggles that we face, his presence gives release. There will be sorrow in life. Jesus said this is true. And he is our comforter that can help me and you. Rejoicing comes from the heart, the new life that Christ gives. No power can overcome when in Jesus one lives. So join with me this Christmas. Give thanks to God above. He sent his son to earth on abundance of love. To live is to be with Christ, with death his presence gain. Remember the hope God gives, even in deepest pain. With our family this year, a special time of joy, one Tristan Dallas Rollins was born our first grand boy. Y'all really didn't think that wasn't going to make it in there. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all, from all our family. May God give you all you need. This is our wish for thee. In our hearts and prayers, we begin to worship this morning. Dear God, we come before you today to praise you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you for this special time of year that remember that Jesus came, that we could have a relationship and be reconciled to you. Dear God, we pray today as we worship in person or at home, we pray for a special sense of your presence, that indeed, Lord, we will know that we've been in your presence as we uh, just come together, Lord. We give our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, and all that we are to you. We come, Lord, to exalt you. Lord, offer a sweet-smelling sacrifice before you. And Lord, as we offer our hearts, we do ask that through the power of your Spirit that you speak to us. Let us know that indeed we have been in the presence of the Almighty God. And God, when you change us, when you convict us, when you transform us, we will give you all the glory for it. So in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. In Psalm 8 and 9, we find these words, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The same angels who were at creation were also there singing about the birth of our Savior, and we rejoice to be in the majesty of God today. So rejoice with us in your hearts as we sing together angels from the realms of glory.
so that we can each go to the Lord in prayer. It's one of the great privileges that God gives us, uh, that we can go direct to him. We don't have to go through a pastor, a priest, or anyone else. We have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ. So let's unite our hearts in prayer. God, we come before you today praising you. Praising you because you created this world. Praising you because you redeem us through your son, Jesus Christ. Praising us because you promise that you will sustain us through all eternity in your presence. We praise you for your beauty, for your majesty. We praise you because you are God. We thank you, Lord, for this time of year that we have to remember the birth of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom that we have to worship. We thank you for the opportunity we have to come before you in prayer. And as we gather this morning, either in person or virtually, we all have different prayers. And we don't know what each other's are, but you do know that you care about us individually so Lord for each request that's been shared in these last few moments we pray for your intervention for your presence we pray Lord that in difficulties and challenges that people will not be driven away from you that they will draw nearer to you Lord I pray as a church that you will help us to reach out to those around us that are hurting, to give us your eyes, to give us your hands, and help us to show the love of Christ in this world so that people will be drawn into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, again, we ask your blessings on this service and I ask that all that we do be to your glory and honor. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Luke 2, 13, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Noel, Noel, born is the king of Israel.
she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. We tend to think of this next carol as a children's carol, but if you listen to the words as an adult, it should have quite meaning to you. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. light and love this holiday season in a time where things can get sad for people where there's a lot of sickness uncertainty in the world lord we just ask that you help keep our eyes focused on you come fill this place fill the hearts and lives of those watching online and may we be forever changed as we leave here today bless our worship bless our time together and it's in thy son's precious and holy name we pray amen like this
shepherds left their flocks by night to see this baby wrapped in light. A host of angels led them straight to you. It was just as the angels said, you'll find him in a manger bed. Emmanuel and Savior, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. A star shone up in the east to Bethlehem the wise men three came many miles and journeyed straight to you and to the place at which you were their frankincense and golden myrrh they gave to you and cried out baby boy would grow to be a man one day and died for me my sins would drive the nails in you that rugged cross it was my cross too still every breath you drew We've got an um, interesting table in front of us this morning. Um, it started out with the manger scene, and um, then we added two flowers, one for Adelie Brooke Bain, the daughter of Joseph and Whitney Bain, and grandparents Donald and Sherry Bain. It's a flower that we have over here, over on this side. We have a flower for River Joseph McLaurin, grandson of Walter and Laura McLaurin. As we continue to move over to the side, the Morgan Johnson family came by and asked that um, and said they wanted to bring flowers for us in memory of Morgan this morning. Uh, they are from his funeral yesterday, and so those are the flowers that we have over here to my left and your right. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? We have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords born in a manger that allows us to live forever. We have the hope that comes with the birth of two new children. We have the remembrance of someone that was, remember, that was a member of our church and that loved the Lord. Our passage today, and you can turn to John 1 if you would with me, we're going to talk about what is our identity? What makes us who 
we are. For the newborns, what will they be known of? Right now, they're child or grandchild. For the parents and grandparents. But what will they be? Morgan lived a full life. Do I tie his identity to his military service? Do I tie his identity to being here in Eastover and supporting the community for so long? Do I think of Morgan as the Eastover Sanitary District guy? I suspect if you talk to Morgan, one of the things he would say don't leave out is he's a Texan. Our identities are multifaceted. But the question is, what is the one most dominant characteristic of my identity? Because it makes a difference in understanding who I am. When we think about Jesus in the manger, what is it that we need to make sure that we know? What are the one or two or three crucial things that we have to know in order to understand who Jesus is? Now, since we ended up canceling the cantata uh, today, I decided to do a two-part series based on the Gospel of John. Two easy sermon titles. Jesus is God. Jesus is man. And we need to make sure that we understand both those concepts of Jesus' identity. Today, we're going to look at the idea that Jesus is God. Um, and so I'm gonna, I don't normally do this, um, but y'all have been sitting for a while. So I'm going to stay, ask that you stand as we read God's Word. God's Word says in John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Life was in Him. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Dear Lord, we just ask as we come before you now, again praising you as God, we thank you for your word, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the chance that we have now to look at your word through the power of your spirit and ask, Lord, that you will speak to us, convict us, comfort us, draw us deeper and closer to you. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it's interesting when we think about the identity of Jesus. There's a lot of different ideas. He was a good man. He was a good teacher. He did a lot of really good things. The Mormons would say that Jesus is a God. But what they would tell you is, it's not just that Jesus is a God. It's that one time he was a man. And so therefore you can be a God. What Jesus was, a man, we are. What Jesus is a God, we can become. That's the wrong identity of Jesus. Jesus has always been God. If we were to talk to the Jehovah's Witness, they would say that he's the same as the archangel Michael, that he's not God, that he's not worthy to be worshipped. If you listen to the Jesus Seminar, I actually bought a book last night at the Dollar General that I thought about buying for a while. It says, The Unknown Jesus. I'm confident when I read that this week, I'm going to run across a lot of heresy. It'll probably tell me that Jesus Mary Magdalene, Mary Mary Magdalene had multiple children and settled down somewhere in Italy. I know that's one of the philosophies that they've said over the years, trying to identify the historical Jesus. It's important that we know who Jesus is. And so again, our theme today, Jesus Christ is fully God. Jesus Christ is fully God. God. Now what we're going to do as we look at this passage is how is Jesus identified as God? How Jesus is identified as God by John in this passage. It starts with in the beginning. Now if we were not talking about the gospel of John and you grew up in a church, I suspect that if I said the phrase in the beginning and asked you to complete that sentence, 90% of us that grew up in a church would finish it with God created the heavens and the earth. Whenever I hear the phrase, in the beginning, I think God created the heavens and the earth. That's where John wants your mind to go. John, when he starts with NRK, he, he, there are other meanings that could be attached to it, but there is no question that what John wants us to do at the very beginning, because John 
remember now, he wrote his gospel later than most of the others. This is going to be near the end of the first century when he writes, could be as late as the year 90, 50, 60 years after Jesus is gone, that he's writing this gospel. And what he wants people to remember, they talked about this man and Paul spread the gospel uh, throughout Europe, is this idea that Jesus is God. In the beginning, he's associated with creation. And that's what he addresses. In the beginning was the word. It's interesting that he uses the word logos here. The word, word. Um, it, because you, know, you just kind of read that. Why would you call somebody word? Now, if we're writing in the Greek, the Greek culture, when they hear the word logos, they think of an impersonal, abstract principle of reason and order. The Greeks loved logic. That's why philosophers were so popular in Greek culture. And so this word logos is kind of this, the, the, this logos is an abstract principle of words that you're trying to come up with reason and order. John wants us to know that Jesus is the embodiment of reason and order. The idea that that would be an embodied person would be a foreign concept to the reader from Greek, but it's going to be the premise of which John is going to continue throughout his gospel. What about to the Jewish readers, the Hebrew readers? Well, they would hear Lagos, would easily think of the Word of God. And the Word of God is God speaking, divine wisdom and power. Jesus is the embodiment of divine wisdom and power. John wants us to make sure that we understand in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And then he adds, the Word was God. So in the beginning, when the world was created, Jesus was already there. He's with God, and then not only is he with God, he is God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Again, in the beginning, reminding us of creation. John's very clear here that he wants to make sure that we understand from the very beginning, Jesus is God. He doesn't want there to be confusion. Whenever we use language, there is always the opportunity for confusion. Anytime we send out a message from the church, uh, that's not unusual that we get somebody to say, hey, I'm not sure about this part, and we have to provide some clarifications because words can be hard to, um, to, sometimes we can't express ourselves right. Now, this is about 1977. I'm taking an eighth grade social studies test with a teacher known as Mr. K. Had a long last name, and he just says, call me Mr. K. And I had to remind myself not to say Coach K, because I've heard that now for 30 years. But Mr. K was my social studies teacher. And uh, he asked a question on our test. True or false? The USSR and Russia are the same thing. Now, for you born after the 80s, I want us to go back to the 70s, those born especially after the 90s, after the Iron Curtain fell. Russia and the Soviet Union, the USSR, were often used synonymously. If you said Russia, if you said the Soviet Union, it was all generally, it was assumed that it was that same group of countries that have since broken off with the fall of the Soviet Union, but Russia was the main country. Now, culturally, language wise, they would tell us that Russia and USSR were often interchanged and therefore they were the same thing. And so, Mr. K expected us to answer true. The problem is, I've always liked geography, and I've always liked politics. And I knew that Russia was just one of the states of the USSR, and indeed, they were not the same thing. And so, I would argue, I correctly put false. And he marked it wrong. I'm not bitter. It's the only test I can remember from middle school or high school, the only question from any test I remember from middle school or high school. And there's a reason. He's wrong. <laughs> Don't confuse identity. Russia, USSR are not the same thing. Jesus is not an ordinary man. He may have been born in a manger. He may have had to learn how to walk and to talk tells us that he grew in Luke chapter 2, that he grew in wisdom and favor with God and man. But he was God. 
before he was conceived in Mary, Jesus existed. And we need to make sure that we understand that Jesus is God. In fact, in the Gospel of John, the name of God in the Old Testament, Yahweh, is I am. Seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is going to answer a question or make the statement, I am. Now, there are other statements, I am light, I am the resurrection, and those are normally the seven I am statements. When you hear that expression, the seven I am statements in John, that's what you'll think of, but it's I am. And it's Jesus pronouncing, I am God. And so John's gospel is very clear throughout that Jesus is God. Now, Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elemental forces of the world, and not based on Christ. Don't be confused when the world says it's impossible for Jesus Christ to die and raise again. And don't be confused when people say it's impossible for Jesus Christ to be God. Jesus is God. Verse 9, for the entire fullness of God's nature the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. I don't know how that works, but I know it's true. Jesus Christ is directly identified as God, no questions. If I understand that Jesus is God, then the first thing I have to do is I have to respond by him being God. I have to respond with his call to salvation, to belief that Jesus Christ indeed is God, that Jesus Christ physically died on the cross, that Jesus Christ physically raised from the dead. And so I, want to, I have to have that faith that that's who Jesus is, that he died paying the price for my sins, that he raised from the dead, giving me victory over death. He's ascended to heaven and waiting to come again. When I believe that, God's going to reveal a couple of other things to me. I, I get saved by faith, but my response to that belief is that I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to recognize the holiness of God. I'm going to recognize who he is, and I'm going to confess my sins. I'm also going to surrender my life to Christ. I remember a song our youth group used to sing at Main Street, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes. That's the answer. Yes, Lord. What do you want me to do? Yes, Lord. Remember Isaiah when he had the great vision of God? He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm, he's just undone. And in God, they say, whom shall we send? And Isaiah says, send me. We want to surrender our life to Christ. That's what happens when we know Christ. And so the first thing that we have to do during this Easter season as we contemplate this text and as we look at it is, is Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior? But the other thing that I want to do is if I recognize indeed that Jesus is God, it's hard enough to identify individuals, talk about the different areas of their life. What about God? Am I going to get to know God if I don't spend time with him. If I want to understand as best I can how Jesus is God, I need to take time to study the Bible. Not just read through it quickly, but to meditate and consider what it means. God's word should always be understood as what it meant to the original reader, the principles that apply, and what does that mean to me. That's the tool we're going to try to help you with come the first of the years, that I can, every one of us can look at a passage, encourage you to have a study Bible, that's all you need, see what it means, what principle still remains, how does that a principle apply in my life? That's the goal of reading the Bible. We need to take time. If I want to know God, if I want to know the God that is this, the God of this world, I must spend time reading the Bible and letting his Holy Spirit speak to me through his truth. God chose to reveal himself through his word. The second thing is, and this is consistent in the Gospel of John, and we'll see it again as we continue in this passage, that if I want to know God, I have to know his mission. I have to know what God wants me to do. I need to join in that mission. What is it that God wants me to do as God of this world, in his world? What does God want me to do to fulfill his mission? Is it to reach out to my neighbor next door? 
Is it to reach out and comfort somebody I work with? Is it during Christmas to try to have a conversation with someone in my family that I know is not slaved? I'm not going to thump them on the Bible. But can I steer a conversation to why it means so much to me to be a Christian? Am I intentional about being on mission with God? Because Jesus is directly identified as God. Jesus is directly involved in creation. Jesus is directly involved in creation. Verse 3. All things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. When it says all things, you know what that means in the Greek? All things. When it says one thing was not created that he didn't create, you know what that means in the Greek? Not one thing was created that Jesus didn't create. He is the active agent of creation. Jesus is is directly involved in creation. If you've been reading the read the uh, word of the day, devotional with us, the last two days have been the significance of Jesus being involved. And by the way, if you're new here and having getting that devotion, we provide it as a church for free. You can put it on your phone. I never we have books available. I never look at the book. I use my phone because uh, if I see one I like, I'll send it to somebody, and it's a good way to communicate with people. And but anyway, word of the day, just contact the church office, and we can get you hooked up with that. Uh, all we need is an email address. So, in that devotion the last two days, it's been talking about God's the creator. That's just great for this time of year. Because the God of creation came to earth. And it reminds us, especially the devotion today, is that if there is a creator, everyone understands that we have to answer to that creator. And that's why secular scientists are trying to to change the rules of science and the logic of science to say no intelligent design doesn't exist, but, but there is no question. The more we learn about this world, that it had a creator. And we understand as Christians that that creator is God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, with Jesus being the primary creative agent. Therefore, We should submit ourselves to the one that created us because he's the one that knows how the world is supposed to work. He knows how we work. He knows how we're supposed to interact within the world. The story is told. uh, Henry Ford and a guy that worked for him named Charles, or that he consulted with called Charlie Steinmetz, considered a great man at fixing equipment, and they had a generator that was having issues. Charlie didn't want anybody to help him. He just gave me a paper and pencil. After two days, he put a mark on the generator near the top. He told the engineers, he said, remove that plate. Remove 16 wing dings from the field coil. And it would work. It worked fine. He sent a bill to Henry Ford for $10,000. Henry Ford said, that's way too much. So he wrote him back. And he said, on the note, one dollar for the mark on the generator. Nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars to know where to put the mark. God knows us. God knows where we need to put the mark. God knows what we need to be. You know why? Because He created us. I love how Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this beginning in verse 17. Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. This is how the Gentiles, being those that don't know Christ, in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened to their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They become callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. Basically, the world's going to act like the world. We, by the way, as believers, should never look down on how an unbeliever acts because they're going to act the way people act without Christ in their hearts. And we should not expect any different. We should be loving because that was us. In fact, Paul continues. But that is not how you learned about the Messiah, 
assuming you heard about him and were taught in him, because of the truth is it because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your old former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. We take off the old man and we put on the new man. We make sure that God as creator has made us a new creation. When I get saved, I am not the same. I now have a soul that is guaranteed to go to heaven. Satan's victory over me in sin has now been defeated. It's been taken away. And I have victory because God is the creator and he creates a new me, a new soul for me at the time that I receive salvation. God's directly involved in creation and he can make us a new creation. Now again, if I want to improve as this new creation, we don't want to be babes in Christ like Paul chastised the Corinthians for being. How as a new creation can I more directly support God, the one that created me? Again, stay on mission with God. What's the mission statement for our church? Helping individuals reach their potential in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to do as a church. We want to help you reach the potential that you have in Jesus Christ. Ephesians in chapter 2 tells us that grace is by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. But then it says that we are created as God's masterpiece to do good works, which God determined beforehand. So before I was ever born, before in the beginning, God had a plan for me. And God had a plan for you. And so our job as a church, what we want to do as a church, is we want to help every individual reach that potential that Jesus Christ has for them. And so we want to just grow in what we do. So how do I do that? Well, I want to bear fruit. It's an illustration that Jesus uses in John chapter 15. There's a couple of different ways to think of fruit. One way that we think of fruit is the idea that we help people become Christians. We bear fruit by people from us getting to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we want to be part of people coming to know Jesus Christ. A second primary way, there's, there's more than two ways, but the two primary ways we see fruit used in the Old Testament is our character. The fruit of the Spirit. By the way, singular fruit. What should be evidence in all of us through the power of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What do I do in my life? to help me grow those characteristics. What can I do to be more loving, to be more gentle? I'll be honest, I, I was telling somebody this week, I, one of the good things about my voice is I can go to a funeral outside, graveside service, and you can hear me from about 40 feet away without a lot of problem. The problem is when I'm four feet away from you, that comes across pretty harsh. So I have to be careful and watchful of trying to be gentle and not just blowing somebody's doors off with my voice. So that's one thing I have to do. What is it that I need to do for love, joy, peace, pay, joy? Maybe right now I need to make sure that I'm experiencing joy. It's easy to get frustrated with everything that's going on, especially here at the holiday season. But true joy shines through circumstance. Maybe... I need to be doing something in my life, more time in prayer, more time reading the Bible so that God can just fill me with his joy. Scripture says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you've been around a drunk, you know it, because they're filled with alcohol. Can people say around me they know they've been around a Christian because the Holy Spirit just comes out of me because it just overflows in my life? Am I making sure the Spirit overflows through my life, that I'm taking specific action for that to happen. Because Jesus is directly involved in creation and in creating me. Jesus is directly involved in salvation. Jesus is directly involved in salvation. Verse 4, life was in him. Now there are two words in Greek 
that can be used for life. One is zoe, which is a spiritual life. One is bios, biology, bios, which means a physical life. The word here in the Greek is zoe, spiritual life. Our spiritual life was in Christ, in him. And that life was the light of men. We're in a dark world. That's a key theme in the Gospel of John. Dark is always bad. Anything at night, you just read through John's Gospel. If it's, a dark, if it's happening around dark, it's bad. Good things happen with the light. That light, life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. Another word to use there is comprehend it. The darkness didn't understand it. That, that's a huge deal in John's Gospel. Jesus is going to the temple. He's talking to the leaders for all these, at all these different festivals. And they, he keeps saying, look, I come from the Father and I do his work. And they're not recognizing Jesus as the Father. And so the, 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 the Jewish leaders do not comprehend that Jesus is God. It's a huge part of John. In fact, really up until the last night with the disciples, that's what you see in the gospel. After the prologue, that, that, that's what plays out. Is they did not comprehend the darkness. Jesus is light. They overcome it. I've used this illustration before, but, but it works good. If you have a glove, what makes the glove work? Not the glove. I, I, I got, we're just, by the way, um, I got gloves from my mother-in-law last year at Christmas because I said I lost my gloves. And much to my surprise, in mid-January, I opened the glove compartment for something else, and there were my gloves because, um, you know, you'd think you'd put gloves in a glove compartment and it never dawned on me to check there. So those gloves in the glove compartment, what good were they? They're just gloves. When do they have use? When there's something inside the glove to use the glove. Wear the glove. We don't have any use without the life of Christ within us. That's how we're effective. That's how we honor God, is by allowing him to direct us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul wrote this, beginning in verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is similar to what we've talked about before. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God. Who, and this is the part I really want to emphasize on this verse, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. He brings us to salvation. God called me, told the disciples, I've chosen you, you've not chosen me. God calls us and gave us. Jesus reconciles us and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. One of the specific tasks that we are given in Scripture, understanding that Jesus is the Savior of the world, is that we are to share that salvation with the world. What can I do to help others be reconciled with Christ? When I was growing up and people talked about doing evangelism, the idea was you just need to go tell people about Jesus and see if they get saved or not. Just cold call, walk up and start talking. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't help some now and it can happen. But for most of us, that's not an easy thing to do. That's well outside our, com our comfort zone. But what we can all do is we can be intentional about having a conversation about Jesus Christ is active in my life. Here's how God gave me peace. Here's how God gave me comfort. Here's how God helped me get through a difficult time. Here's why I have joy. Here's why I have hope. Here's why I have peace, because of Christ in my life. And every one of us can be a witness to what Christ has done in our life by being intentional in our conversations about Jesus. Why do you like Christmas? Do I start with because Jesus Christ came to earth and died for my sins? Now on the sentimental side, I might like going to my parents the best or I might like the food or whatever. But the most important thing, any conversation I have about Christmas, can't we all work in that Jesus Christ came to earth and then died for my sins so I could have a relationship with him? And then if somebody asks me that I can follow up. But we need to be intentional about having conversations about God in our life. And by the way, for that to happen, you know what has to happen? The other things we talked about today. I've got to be involved with God in my life for God to be an overflow, so I talk about him. Encourage people in difficult times with the promises of God. 
Not in a way that's, unsensitive, that's insensitive to the struggles they're having. But let people know God loves them. Especially, especially when it seems like a time he doesn't care because so much has gone wrong. We can always be an encouragement. An encourage on the promises of God. Jesus is directly identified as God. Jesus is directly involved in creation. Jesus is directly involved in salvation. It's interesting as we look at the two Christmas stories. Mark picks up at the baptism of Jesus. Um, John doesn't do the Christmas story. He starts with this cosmic beginning. Jesus was in the beginning, so he doesn't do the Christmas story. But Matthew and Luke are our two Christmas stories. Interesting in Matthew, after they tell the Christmas story, who comes to see Jesus? The wise men. Bringing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So when I hear about Jesus being God, Jesus coming to earth to save my sin, one of the responses I should have is that I want to worship Jesus and bring a gift to him. Worship God with a heart, my whole soul, my strength, what's pictured physically. We should respond to the Christmas story by giving of ourselves in worship. What about in Luke? It's the shepherds out in their field. Sheila read some of that earlier. Do you know what they did afterwards? After they encountered Jesus, they went back and on their way, they told people what they saw. That's our other response to the Christmas story, is we should tell others. Jesus is God. He came in the form of man, giving up the glories of heaven so that we could be reconciled to God. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation. What is it that God wants to impress upon my heart today so that I can be his? I want to ask you something. If you knew the Queen of England was coming to your house this afternoon or the president was coming to your house this afternoon, would you be sitting around in your gym shorts and T-shirts? That's the standard attire at the Campbell house. Shorts and a T-shirt. Would you be sitting around in your bummy clothes? Or do you think you might clean a little bit? Do you think you might put on some nice clothes? Do you think you would prepare for the arrival of a president or a queen? How much more should we prepare for the next arrival of Jesus Christ when he returns? He came once in a manger. Next time he comes and completes victory to take us to heaven, to be with him forever. Will you bow your heads with me? Before we pray, I just want to give us a moment for God to speak to us. What is God saying to you this morning? Do you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you need to respond to his call? If you're already a believer, is God talking to you this morning about being committed, more committed, recommitment to studying the Bible, knowing more about Him? Is God calling you to service in this church or another church, where it is that you can help build the body, help His kingdom grow, be on mission with God, reach my potential? Jesus Christ being what God created that's our vision statement being what God created me to be do I want to be what God created me to be what does God want me to do today Jesus directly involved in salvation wants us to go tell others what am I going to do to share the gospel with someone else how is it God speaking to you what action can you take in response to the Holy Spirit this morning? Dear God, we praise you as the one true God. Thank you that you speak to us through your word. Move in our hearts, our minds, and our souls for your glory. During this time, and as we continue through the day and through the week. It's in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray. 
Amen. Go ahead and stand for our last song. Chuck work overtime today. Uh, he knew he was going to play the guitar for Sheila, and then she said, by the way, you're going to help the praise team. And, um, and I was going to give him to grab, actually, Chuck, I asked you to grab your mic because I was going to get you to pray right now. But you got one in, so you got a mic, so you're good. So I'm going to ask Chuck to close us with a benediction this morning. Okay. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house. Lord, we're coming into your house today with not the best of circumstances. We know that there are those in our congregation that are hurting right now. We have many that are sick. We have many that um, have lost loved ones. And as John mentioned a little bit earlier, sometimes this time of year brings heartache to many of us. But God, I just lift this body and congregation up to you today. I just pray for healing for those that, that need it. I pray for spiritual awakening for those that need it. And God, I just thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us as you pulled us through this year. And we just look forward in anticipation for all the great things that we have to come in the coming year. God, go with us now as we leave this place. We just ask your shield of protection around us, and we ask that you forgive us for our many sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.